Hello, my name is Bart Tingena from Belgium. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Felipe Carpes for the invitation uh, to make a video on ACL injury prevention and how to translate findings from research to practice. Um, I think it's a very good idea and a very good initiative to, to be able to share some ideas by this kind of media over here with a video to an international audience. So thank you again, Felipe, for this invitation. Maybe a short background of myself. Um, I'm a physiotherapist. I completed my PhD last year in September, which was focused on post-war control in relation to knee and ankle injuries at KU Leuven, Belgium. And currently I'm working as a postdoc at KU Leuven and another university in Belgium, University of Hasselt. So ACL injuries, what is actually the problem? ACL injuries occur mainly in a young and active, mainly female population. But more concerning is the fact that we have quite disappointing long-term outcomes. For example, low return to sport rates, high re-injury risk, decreased physical activity levels on the long term, increased knee osteoarthritis risk, and also high costs for the society. In 30% of cases, these injuries occur by contact mechanisms. However, in 70% of cases, these injuries occur mainly by just doing a, let's say, wrong movement. They occur by a non-contact mechanism. But the basic question is then, can we reduce ACL injury risk? What is the evidence? If we look at this meta-analysis of 2012 of Greg Meyer, we see already that there is indeed evidence favoring the interventions. When we look at this more recent meta-analysis, we see the same, actually, that there is around 50% decreased ACL injury risk while performing these injury prevention programs. So yes, we can reduce ACL injury risk. So the next question is, what can we do to reduce these ACL injuries? And the answer is training. Most studies use multiple interventions to target ACL injury risk, including strengthening, proximal control exercises, movement education, feedback, jump training, plyometrics, balance training, and agility exercises. Actually, we don't really know which is now the best or the most optimal combination of these different interventions, but we know that combining multiple interventions results in better outcomes compared to single interventions alone. In the next slides, I will give a short overview of some examples of exercises that can be included in such an ACL prevention program. Here we see some proximal control exercises targeting especially the postrolateral gluteal uh, hip musculature in different positions. Not only in, in lying, sitting, but also here in standing and in really functional positions. Here we see some examples of progressive exercises targeting the posterior chain including the glutes, including the hamstrings, and the, including the posterior chain of the trunk, uh, which we can progress towards exercises in standing on one leg and even on different surfaces. As we earlier discussed, it's very important to also include dynamic jumping and plyometric exercises within the ACL injury prevention program. We can start with relatively easy double-act single directional movements, but afterwards, it's very important to progress towards multi-directional single-act movements, as we can see here uh, in the slide with different examples, to really challenge your whole body movement control in different directions, let's say not only in the sagittal plane, but also in the frontal and transversal plane. Here we see another few examples of different really dynamic multi-directional exercises first on two legs, performing here the tuck jump in side direction, but
but also the one leg landing in the forward direction and the lateral single leg movement control in the lower exercises. Balance exercises can also be implemented quite easily during normal training, especially during the warming up for example. We can do exercises on two legs but also on one leg and we can also challenge the postural control system by uh, going more on unstable surfaces for example or working with perturbations for example by throwing a ball and working in, in pairs or in groups as you can see here in the pictures. Furthermore it can be very challenging to include some exercises where we exclude the visual system. And finally we see here some examples of really multidirectional agility exercises. But it's not only about what we do, it's also about how we do these exercises. How do we instruct our athletes to perform these exercises? It's very important. Over the last couple of years, there is really more and more attention in literature to motor learning in terms of ACL injury prevention. For example, this paper here of Anna Benjamins and colleagues is a really interesting overview of some motor learning aspects. Well, I'm not going into full detail of all motor learning aspects over here, but I will just give some small examples. One of the issues in terms of ACL injury prevention and motor learning are the instructions we are providing to our athletes while performing the exercises. Traditionally, most trainers provide feedback with an internal focus of attention. For example, instructing athletes to bend the knees while landing or to keep the knee over the toe. However, we know these days, based on more current evidence, that using feedback with an external focus of attention can be more effective. For example, in the first video over here, on the left side, instructing patients to reach towards the cones instead of bending the knees. In addition, we have to be aware that athletes performing during ball sports, for example here during volleyball, they have constantly to change their planning and their actions based on the movements of the ball, the movement of the opponents and the teammates, for example. So they're really moving within open environments. Therefore, it can be very useful to include more unplanned, complex and multidirectional movements within our ACL injury prevention program. We should target exercises within open environments, meaning that here, for example, on the video, the athlete has to adapt direction based on the movement of the other player or the environment they're moving in. And hereby we include some cognitive aspects of movement training and some visual motor interactions which are more and more recognized to be very important in terms of ACL injury prevention. On the last line here we see some very important messages or very important principles that should be taken into account during the ACL injury prevention program. We need variation, we need progressive exercises which should be challenging and at the end it should be fun. When do we start to introduce these neuromuscular training interventions and these ACL injury prevention programs? When we look at these data we see that there is indeed evidence shown that when we target our prevention programs in the mid-teens or even in the early teens that the effectiveness of the neuromuscular training to reduce ACL injury risk is higher. So the earlier we start, the better the results. And we should really try to take advantage here of the tremendous learning potential and neuroplasticity within the young athletes, within the teenagers. That's very important. How much do we need to train? Well, this can be very dependent on the individual. 
but there are some clear dosage effects of neuromuscular training interventions. The higher the training volume, the better the effect. And a high training volume was here defined as at least 30 minutes each week. If we compare the duration of a neuromuscular training session and we look at long training interventions defined by at least 20 minutes, then we also have an indication that this can be more effective compared to short uh, neuromuscular training sessions. The frequency of training interventions can also matter. If you compare training programs focusing on training only once in a week compared with multi-frequency training defined by training at least two times in a week, we see that multi-frequency training results in better outcomes. In line with these dosage effects, it's also very important to have a high compliance with these training interventions. The higher the compliance, the better the effects. Based on this short overview within this video, I think it can be clear that there is more and more evidence that we can indeed reduce ACL injury risk. But to be really effective on a large scale, we really need implementation. Implementation in the field. And this goes far beyond the individual athlete. We really have to target parents, schools, coaches, teachers, sports organizations, and even the government to really make people aware that we can uh, reduce ACL injury risk with specific training. And implementation is, is really the key. Some take home messages of today. ACL injury prevention works, especially when we use multi component programs and when we apply the training in the younger population. So, the youth development is really a key uh, aspect of preventive training. The compliance and dosage are really important and should be high enough to get good results. And furthermore, we should be well aware that there are a lot of uh, good developments in research in terms of motor learning. And we should be aware that the traditional way that we teach our athletes to move or how to instruct them to move is not always the best way. We should be very good aware of that. And of course, nothing is perfect. We need, we need optimizations of these injury prevention programs. For example, we also need uh, more attention for male athletes. Most research has been conducted uh, in female, with females. So we really need more attention to male athletes. And maybe the most important message of today is that we need implementation. We need to get these training programs to the field. We need to do them. Not simply stating that they are, can be effective. No, they have to be implemented in the, in the field. Hereby, I would like to, to finish my overview of ACL injury prevention. If there are any questions, you can contact me by mail or you can find me on Twitter. Thank you.